These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. In the south, Asa, grandson of Rehoboam, is king of Judah, and has been for quite some time now. In the north, King Omri founded a new dynasty atop the corpses of the previous Israelite dynasty and moved the capital to his new city of Samaria. He conquered the Moabites and honestly probably did some more stuff too, but we don't actually have records of it. And now, as we start today's episode, Omri is dying. There won't be a succession crisis because his son Ahab has been co-ruler for a few years, a common enough arrangement in ancient monarchies, and Ahab is going to be our focus today. Because depending on how you parse things out exactly, he gets the honor of being one of, or perhaps the, very first king with a substantial extra-biblical mention. But of course, we can't have anything uncomplicated. He is going to get mentioned for a battle that takes place completely outside the biblical narrative. And so in a sense, we're going to talk today about two Ahabs, the biblical character and the historical character. But fortunately, there isn't too much contradiction here. We're just going to do our best to make sure we're clear about which one we're on about. And depending on your biblical perspective, you can consider it however you like. Now, on the Bible front, unlike most northern kings, we actually spend a ton of chapters in Ahab's reign. Almost as many, in fact, as we spend on Solomon, and fourth most in the whole Deuteronomistic cycle, be not only by David, Saul, and Solomon. But what most Bible readers actually remember about Ahab is that he was a wicked king with a skanky wife. This is because most of his chapters are not actually his, but they describe the adventures of the prophet Elijah, and the king himself and wider Israelite context are mostly the stage upon which that hero stands. But that means, in order to start poking at Ahab, we need to poke at the prophet a good bit first. Which gets me to a problem. I don't really know what to make of Elijah historically. You see, probably the majority of famous biblical figures have a narrative tale and also some miracle tales. Now, for someone like me, I've seen one miracle in my life, you know, not counting God's plan, God's creation sort of things. Then I know that all that holds very little water for those not already on the God boat, and so I'm perfectly happy personally with miracle tales in general. Though even then, it does seem to be far more common to claim a miracle than actually experience one. But for someone who demands at the outset that history be purely naturalistic, you see, most of these miracle stories in the Old Testament, they're not actually a huge issue for someone like that. You can assign natural origins to the plagues of Egypt, at least potentially, and you can still have a lot of the Exodus that way. You can pull the miracle out of all of Joshua's victories and still have a conquest narrative. This is basically what we do with the conquest narratives of all the Mesopotamian kings. They say, oh, the god so-and-so came and helped me, and we just ignore that he thinks it was the god. We just assume the victory still happened. I mean, through all of this, you can claim that the prophets and miracle experiencers were just making stuff up, or that they were crazy, and most of it still sort of works. When they have a prophecy that actually happens, you can say, well, those got canonized, and a whole bunch of other predictions that were just as crazy got lumped in under the false prophets, and everyone was just guessing. But with Elijah, and even more with his prophetic successor, Elisha, their stories are just so much more intertwined with the miracle stories than most biblical miracle narratives, which kind of sounds odd, but having looked through it, I think that's generally accurate. You can even pull a lot of miracles out of Jesus' ministry and still have the core of what he did. But if you remove or naturalize all the miracles for Elijah and Elisha, 
I mean, Elisha has almost nothing left, and Elijah does have a bit, but he has much, much less going on. And so with the stories of Elijah, I'm much less confident in saying, like I normally do, that you can just ignore the miracles if you want to, and what you have left is history, because there isn't much left at this point. These guys were traveling miracle workers. That was their whole shtick. And so I should probably real quickly summarize the career of Elijah at this point, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about if you're less familiar with what he did with his life. Now it starts in 1 Kings chapter 17, and he's just one of many prophets running around. Now King Ahab, the main focus for today, he's not the favorite king of our biblical narrator, to put it lightly. Like his father, he was an idolater, but then we also get told that in addition to his idolatry, another indicator that he was worshipping Yahweh just through the medium of golden calves, in addition to just idolatry, he's become a proper polytheist. He marries Jezebel, who is a woman and therefore terrible, and because she's from the Canaanite city of Sidon, he politely adopts her faith at least in part, by worshipping Baal personally and using royal funds to patronize a temple to Baal and another for Asherah. Now that Asherah is the Hebrew version of the name Atirat, who we saw in our reading of the Baal cycle. She's just another Canaanite deity. Anyway, because Ahab is now both an idolater and a polytheist, God sends Elijah as a prophet to warn him to repent or things will go badly for him. Now Ahab ignores this warning and boom, a miraculous drought hits the nation for a few years. Elijah, through all this, is miraculously fed by some birds. Then he's miraculously fed by a widow. Then the widow's son either gets sick or dies, and Elijah uses a procedure quite similar to a Mesopotamian medical diagnostic ritual on the boy. Then he gets well again, or he comes back to life. Then in the third year of the famine, he organizes a contest where King Ahab watches Elijah versus the priests of Baal, each try to light a fire using nothing but prayer, and Elijah wins, then urges the people to slaughter the members of the religion that he doesn't approve of. Then, after a mob kills all the fleeing pious men and beats them to death with whatever improvised weapons they have at hand, God smiles upon the land and creates a great rain to break the drought and wash the pagan blood from Israel's holy soil. Then Elijah ran a race against the king's chariot and won, probably because chariots are terrible in the rain. Then Elijah climbs Mount Horeb and has some prophecy. Then he picks up Elisha as his apprentice. Then he goes back to Ahab while Ahab is doing evil things and announces that Ahab's entire family will get killed, which won't actually happen for like 150 years. But then Elijah outlives Ahab and gets involved with his successor Ahaziah. Then Elijah kind of dies but actually gets taken by God to live forever in heaven. Now after Elijah, we have the tales of Elisha which are similar in character, but even more miracle-focused. This is the, the famous mauling the youths with the bear and calling heaven, fire from heaven to burn people up. Elisha, don't play. But of course, we don't have contemporary historical evidence for either of these guys. I mean, not that we would really expect it. We are super thrilled to have like maybe four mentions of some major kings and major battles from this entire century. So even quite popular religious figures are likely to get missed by archaeology. I mean, how much archaeological evidence are you going to find for a bear mauling? Especially as they were expressly opposed to the government, and therefore they were enemies of the people, who were most often responsible for writing history. Not that we have any contemporary sources from Israel or Judah in this period. In any case, all of our mentions come from neighboring nations. Anyway, 
If we're quite happy having God send guys running around doing miracles, then there's nothing here that really contradicts any major history. Some prophets of the era do show up around major battles, but they mostly just give advice in a way that would normally be invisible, if not for the theological motivation of recording them in scripture. But if we don't like all the miracles they perform, then these guys, I mean, they kind of start to look like Paul Bunyan or Pecos Bill or similar folk heroes, fictional or 99% fictional guys on whom these stories just sort of accumulate over time. I mean, in a sense, we still do this. What are the great superheroes of today but fictional archetypes on whom modern adventure stories get pinned by all kinds of writers and storytellers? And I do try to... I try to sort of straddle the line with all of this stuff in, in the show. I mean, my own opinion is miracles happen more than we realize, but in an academic sense... We do want to find a middle path because we can't really be certain of a lot of this stuff. And so we want to find where a theoretical, skeptical historian could see the merit in both sides. But the prophets are a place where that just breaks down pretty much completely, especially Elijah and Elisha. You kind of either need to accept God and accept these tales, or reject God and reject these tales. The Bible doesn't have that many places where it's all one or all the other. I mean, there's the resurrection of Jesus, there's these guys, maybe Daniel, but even with Daniel, there's some middle path that can be taken there. Now, I pick to accept these prophets, but we're also fortunately in a position where we might be able to put them aside a little bit when looking at Ahab and the historical period he represents. But before we get to that stuff, what should a secular historian make of King Ahab from the Bible? He's very clearly set up literarily in these tales as a piece of Elijah's narrative. He's the wicked king who makes Elijah's virtue necessary. Now, I would say, in this case, we could potentially pull every Elijah story out of Ahab's life and still have a pretty similar view of a guy who, in any other part of the Bible, would seem as plausible as all the other kings. I mean, just the fact that maybe, assume Elijah was fictional. Does that mean Ahab was fictional in all of Elijah's fictional stories? That's the core issue here that I'm having trouble getting at. Anyway, all that and the fact that we are pretty sure he was at the Battle of Karkar tells us he was probably actually a real king. And the fact that most of his non-Elijah episodes show him at war seems pretty standard for a Near Eastern king in general. And so we're going to mostly avoid the prophetic stuff. We're only going to mention it when we have to, and we're going to see what we can pull in for the biblical narrative for wicked king Ahab. Now his tale first starts in Kings chapter 16 and runs all the way to the end of the book, starting off with a note that he ruled for 22 years and was really terrible. Then it briefly overviews some of his actions, making it pretty clear that all this terribleness is really from a religious perspective, because the first thing it tells us was that he sponsored a temple building program which was hated by God for being for the wrong gods, but he's prosperous enough in all of this to rebuild the city of Jericho, which, of course, God also condemned. Plus, of course, he's influential enough to enter a marriage alliance with a daughter of Sidon, though she turns out to be evil. I mean, if you drop the divine condemnation from all these things, they would all, for a normal king be markers of a vigorous, successful reign, which does seem to be what Ahab had from a secular point of view. Of course, not everything goes well for him. We hear reports of a drought and accompanying famine, 
And actually, the Jewish historian Josephus cites the Ptolemaic historian Manetho, who reports that there was, in fact, a major drought during the reign of Eshbaal, king of Sidon, in Manetho's now-lost Phoenician history writings. Eshbaal is Jezebel's father, suggesting that Ahab and Eshbaal reigned concurrently, thus suggesting that this biblical famine may have been a real event. Now, we don't hear anything directly that suggests the famine had lasting political implications, though, of course, it would have been hard on the people and may have contributed to, on one hand, the set of wars that follows, and on the other hand, the religious violence that we hear about. We can't really place anything confidently on the timeline of Ahab's reign. The stories are more organized around Elijah rather than anything else, but we do hear that at some point, Jezebel orchestrated the killing of a number of Yahwist prophets. And then, of course, that Elijah whipped up a mob to slaughter 450 Baalite priests. Now, I won't say that no one in the ancient world ever killed priests, but this is unusual in that we get a sense from both sides that these are religiously motivated killings of religious figures which actually seems to be super unusual. A polytheist system doesn't really have space for this kind of thing. Priests are killed during war and during raiding, and but I mean, that's mostly for access to the plunder inside the temple. And in many cases, even when the temple's being plundered, a certain amount of protection is given to the priests and the cult icons just for being holy men of some god or another. I mean, not always, but this is a murder and plunder for financial gain, not religiously motivated. Even the gods of enemy cities or of disfavored parts of the pantheon are typically respected by all but the most base of wealth-seeking plunderers. It's pretty much only the Yahwist exclusionism that I can think of that would motivate such killings. Either the Yahwists started attacking false priests, or they protested the foreign gods so much that Jezebel's faction started attacking them to silence them. But the narrative is pretty clear that religious violence was very much in the cards at this point, which is a bit odd because I don't think we hear about priestly slaughters very much after this either. I mean, significantly after this we hear about them, but most of Israel's oppressors that I can think of treat their constant religiously motivated rebellions in a mostly secular fashion. Until you get to the destructions of the temple and the abomination of desolation and those sort of things, but those all have quite a lot of just secular rebellion crushing before they start to mess with the temple. Now overall, it's an interesting story because we can be sure that social unrest occurred in most of the Near East in ancient times from time to time. I mean, you just get unrest sometimes. But we never hear about it in any language except that of rebellion, which needs to be stamped out. Anything smaller than that tends to get ignored in our sources completely, and things large enough to merit a mention, they're just rebellion. Nobody cares about the specific causes. The only thing that the official sources care about is that rebellion gets crushed. There isn't much of historical significance to these killings, though. We already know that the Yahwists hate the polytheists and the idolatrous ruling class. And so the meat of what we're left with historically is Ahab's three wars, in which he seems to make a pretty decent showing for himself. Now, when each of these happened is unclear, but we can start with the first attack by the Syrians on the Israelites. Now, the king in Syria, by which the Bible means Damascus, ruled by Arameans, is listed in the Bible as Ben-Hadad. The best guess is that this is another name for Hadad Ezer, the historically known king from about the same time period. 
Now, Ben Hadad means son of Adad, the storm god, and can be a personal name, but is also a positional title taken by many Near Eastern kings who consider themselves the metaphorical sons of various patron gods, and very rarely the literal sons of their patron gods. Hadad Ezer is an extremely common personal name, meaning Adad, the storm god, is my helper. And so it's pretty easy to see how one king could put both forward as public titles or potentially even bear two names. We don't hear about why Ben-Hadad is attacking Samaria here, but he doesn't really need a reason. He sends a note to Ahab demanding submission because the Arameans are at this point the big powerful people in the region. And Ahab pretty freely offers a nominal submission to avoid a war against a larger power. But Ben-Hadad wants also a substantial tribute. In modern political terms, he doesn't want Israel in his sphere of influence. He wants Israel as a tax-paying vassal. Now, Ahab calls the elders of Israel together. Now, these are a poorly attested but clearly important group who most conclude is sort of the remnants of the old patriarchal tribal system, maybe without much formal power, but who needed to buy in to the reign of any Israelite or Judite king, and they support Ahab in this. Yeah, they say nominal submission is fine, but not foreign taxation, which would have been called tribute. And so Ahab and Ben-Hadad send threats to each other as both sides prepare for war. Now, there's a bit of dispute at this point as to whether Ben-Hadad was at this same time having a drinking party in a tent near the siege or over in the nearby town of Sukkoth. Most translations have the former, but the important part is that the leadership is off on their own while most of the army is setting up the siege of Jerusalem. Ahab actually gets treated pretty sympathetically in this particular story, getting a prophet of the Lord to come to him, and the whole thing sounds favorable enough that it almost sounds like a different original source with a far more pro-Ahab perspective. But the trick that Israel comes up with is to muster a group that looks like a large honor guard, which is able to pass around the siege toward the enemy commander by appearing to come to negotiate. Now, the plan doesn't work completely. They do get found out pretty quickly, but it works well enough to get everyone out on the battlefield, and they manage to chase away the siege and put the Syrian leadership into a rout. Israel pursues, and though Ben-Hadad escapes, they manage a pretty solid victory overall. Now, unlike the earlier battles that we've heard about, Israel appears to be at rough technological parity with the enemy. Though no Israelite chariots are mentioned in this battle, we know at this point that the kings of both north and south kept respectable stables. Now, this is notable not only because chariots are powerful war machines, if not as dominant as they used to be, but also because they are extremely expensive. A nation rich enough to maintain chariots also has the logistics to equip and supply soldiers like any other state. Which makes sense. We know from our extra-biblical sources that Israel still has the Moabites under their control. And though this war with Ben-Hadad portrays Israel as the underdog, they seem to be fighting on pretty even footing, and of course they do end up winning, suggesting that northern Israel is perhaps roughly equivalent at this point with the Damascene Arabs. Not quite equal, but not so far behind either. But though Ben-Hadad lost the campaign this year, Damascus is wealthy enough to replace their losses completely. And we hear that the defeat gets blamed on the leadership being nobility rather than proven military commanders. And so the king kicks his nobles out of the army and reorganizes the leadership along more professional lines. In this, we can see that the early Assyrian military reforms are definitely being heard about and experimented with in other nations. 
And of course, perhaps the Assyrians themselves were experimenting with ideas that were just generally in the air following the crucible of military experimentation of the Bronze Age collapse. Whatever the case, the Assyrians are definitely in the background here as Ben-Hadad looks for expansion opportunities in the increasingly crowded Near East. And so, once the rebuilding period finishes, Ben-Hadad attacks again. The biblical writer wants you to know for certain that Ben-Hadad's rebuilding was effective, describing the scene, The people of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats, but the Syrians filled the country. But wicked King Ahab, the polytheist and idolater, has apparently the full support of God, as expressed through his nameless prophet, and so the badly outmatched Israelites are able to win victory through divine assistance. Then the routing Syrians are chased to the town of Aphek, whose walls are soon overcome, and in the post-battle slaughter, Ben-Hadad attempts to escape death by presenting himself as a slave. Now, we actually don't hear about this much in sources, but it's played as something well-known in the ancient world. Indeed, we know people sold themselves into slavery during hard times, and we know that mass indiscriminate slaughter often accompanied the end of a siege. And we know that slaves were often led away from a battle wearing sackcloth or completely naked with a rope tied around their neck. For a common, desperate person, surrounded by the death of everything they know and the greatest amount of destruction that they will ever personally witness. Once escape no longer appears to be an option, then all that's left is slavery or death. It likely made perfect sense to many to simply present themselves as submissive, no-class slaves in hopes of not being painfully killed. War today forces horrible choices, many as bad as this, but this particular flavor of desperation, of a man or a family tying themselves in slave rags with no idea who's going to take the other end of the rope, or if they'll just be killed anyway, is one that many in the modern West are deeply unfamiliar with. And I bring this up because I've read some sermons and commentaries on this passage that skip over that entirely or emphasize, oh, this is just a ruse to trick King Ahab, maybe to play on his mercy. But to skip over the context of an ancient world in which this sort of thing is a well-known response to the pressures of a post-siege slaughter is to miss something important. Now, in the case of Ben-Hadad specifically, some of this context may not apply. He may have been hoping merely to survive the immediate carnage, then hope for some sort of ransom or settlement after the battle, fully expecting to be recognized once things had calmed down. And sure enough, this is what happens. He ends up signing a pretty rough peace treaty, granting lands that had been conquered in the previous generation and the rights to set up a trade colony in Damascus, when previously a colony had been planted by the Aramaeans in Samaria, reversing the suggestion of economic and political dominance. Now, taking advantage of holding a foreign ruler is usually a great way to get key diplomatic concessions. After all, if you just kill the king, then his son definitely won't grant any concessions, and the war might continue. Here in Texas, we remember that the only reason we won the War of Independence against Mexico is that we captured the Mexican president after the Battle of San Jacinto and forced him to sign a way more generous treaty than we would have gotten just based on military successes. We do remember the Alamo, but we also remember that it was a loss. But Ahab does get condemned for this because Holy Yahweh doesn't care about earthly gains for political Israel. The God of heaven and earth wants Ben-Hadad to be slaughtered. And the penalty for letting him go is that Ahab should also suffer death. But I mean, not for a while. This is one of those delayed penalties, it seems. 
But if you're feeling a bit morally conflicted about the previous episode, where Ahab appears to be a good king blessed by God with great victory, then the next story clears that out right quick. Ahab tries to buy some good land, but the landowner Naboth refuses to sell, out of loyalty to God, tribe, and family. The particulars are theologically interesting, but not relevant beyond him having a good reason not to sell. Now, Ahab's scheming wife Jezebel points out that if Naboth is murdered, then Ahab can get the land for free. So she spreads evil gossip about Naboth and gets him killed, solving all of Ahab's land acquisition problems. But then, of course, Elijah shows up and condemns Ahab, making it super clear that killing people in order to take their stuff is very wrong. At least when God is on the side of the victim rather than the aggressor. No mention is made in my biblical concordance about the story of David and Nabal, even though the names are quite similar and the story is uncomfortably similar. But at least now that Elijah's here, Ahab makes a great show of repenting and he gets a bit of divine forgiveness here. Now, down in the south, we talked about the good king, Asa, of Judah last time. And he had a nice long reign, but at some point he dies and gets succeeded by Jehoshaphat of Judah, who will also have a nice long reign. Now, we're going to save Jehoshaphat for the next episode. But it's enough for to say for now that he was a generally pious guy, particularly in the story of him and Ahab. Anyway... Ahab is sitting around now and realizes that even though he did get a whole bunch of towns off the Arameans in the previous war, he still hasn't gained the town of Ramoth-Gilead. And so he sends a note down to Jehoshaphat offering to go half-seas on the plunder, or something like that, and they get together to attack the Arameans once again. Now, there's a bunch of drama here with the pre-battle auguries, the opinions of the prophets are mixed, but the two kings go into battle anyway. Not much is said of the battle itself, but apparently Ben-Hadad has been playing chess, because his strategy in this fight is to blitz the king. He sends his top chariots to hunt through the battle to find Ahab, who's hiding in plain clothes, and eventually they get an arrow in him, and he retreats, and then he dies ignominiously. And that's all that the Deuteronomist and the Chronicler have to say about wicked King Ahab, concluding with a note that you can learn more about King Ahab by reading The History of the Kings of Israel, a now lost work. But we're not done with Ahab. I mean, we don't have the history of the kings of Israel, but we do have the Kirch Monoliths, the second of which explicitly mentions King Ahab of Israel as leading one component of an allied force against King Shalmaneser III in the battle near the town of Karkar. Now this battle is a big deal, like a really big deal. It is the first certain historical account mentioning the Arab people in all of history. It's the first certain mention of men riding camels into war in history. It's the, probably the first mention of actual cavalry, like men on horseback, as part of a battle rather than just as scouts or messengers. And it is an extra-biblical mention of the fact that the Ammonites existed but weren't very rich or powerful. It is an accounting of a multi-ethnic coalition featuring all the major players of the region, or at least a whole bunch of them, joining up to fight a big bad guy, like the Avengers of the ancient world. Oh, and it also mentions the King of Israel in a confirmable, datable, and only minimally controversial way. But to jump into the Battle of Karkar is kind of like jumping into an Avengers movie without knowing any of the heroes, except maybe Hawkeye. This is Israel acting for the first time on a much wider stage. Indeed, the stage was necessarily smaller before because the great empires were all recessed during the height of David and Solomon's empire. It's quite likely that Israel was only able to grow so large unchecked because the power of their enemies was at low ebb. 
But over the last century, that has slowly been shifting. Before starting the Israel series, we left Assyria off at the year 934 BCE. With the Battle of Karkar, we're now at the year 853, plus or minus a year, of course. Four vigorous, competent, and expansionist kings have ruled the city of Asher at this point, but we're not going to be circling back to them for a little while. For now, it's enough to know, and I think most of you already do, that Assyria will be a big deal, and that big dealness is at this point well underway. In fact, it's probably precisely because of how big a deal the Assyrians are proving that the Battle of Karkar took place at all. Now, we're missing a lot of context here, partly because we haven't looked at the Assyrian side yet, and partly because we just don't have as much as we would like, but the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III builds up to it quite effectively. So I'm just going to read it to you. In the sixth year of his reign, he writes the following about his military activities for the year. In the year of Dian Asher, in the month of Iru, the fourteenth day, I departed from Nineveh, crossed the Tigris, and drew near to the cities of Jammu, near the Baleh River. At the fearfulness of my sovereignty, the terror of my frightful weapons, they became afraid. With their own weapons, his nobles killed Jammu. Into Kitlala and Tir Sharma Ahi I entered. I had my gods brought into his palaces. In his palaces I spread a banquet, his treasury I opened. I saw his wealth, his goods, his property I carried off and I brought to my city, Asher. From Kitlala I departed. To Kar Shalmanasser I drew near. In goatskin boats I crossed the Euphrates the second time at its flood. The tribute of the kings on that side of the Euphrates, of Sangara of Karchemish, of Kundashpi of Kumuhu, of Arame, son of Guzi, of Lali, the Milidean, of Haini, son of Gahari, of Kalparoda, of Hatina, of Kalpuruda, of Gurgum, silver, gold, lead, copper, vessels of copper, at Ina Asher Urtir Asbat, on that side of the Euphrates, on the river Sagur, which the people of Hatti called Pitru, there I received it. From the Euphrates I departed. I drew near to Hulman, that's the city of Aleppo. They were afraid to fight with me. They seized my feet in submission. Silver, gold is their tribute I received. I offered sacrifices before the god Adad of Halman. From Halman I departed. To the cities of Urhuleni, the Hamathite, I drew near. The cities of Adenu, Barga, Argana, his royal cities I captured. His spoils, his property, the goods of his palaces I brought out. I set fire to his palaces. From Argana I departed, to Karkar I drew near. Now we see here the king marching westward, pillaging and plundering. He was not subtle in his campaign, nor was he in a particular hurry. Everyone west of the Euphrates had plenty of time to see what was coming, and plenty of time to fear. That fear could drive whole nations to preemptively surrender, as it seems the city of Aleppo did in this campaign. But that same fear could also, occasionally, drive former enemies and rivals to unite in a common front. Sort of, let's all hang together so we don't hang separately kind of thing. At first they fall, one after another. But by the time Shalmanasser gets to the Orontes River, some 50 miles from the Mediterranean coast, the local powers have all decided to band together. And for our benefit, Shalmanasser politely lists the forces and estimated strengths within the coalition. Now for us, the headline of this list is Ahab the Israelite, who brings 2,000 chariots and 10,000 foot troops, which is a pretty substantial force, second only to Hadad Ezer of Damascus himself, who seems to be the informal leader of the coalition, or at least he gets placed on the top of Shalmanasser's list with 20,000 infantry, 1,200 chariots, and 1,200 cavalry. Only four kings out of 12 managed to bring 10,000 or more men, 
And aside from Israel and Damascus, we have a force from the Syrian town of Hamath, way up in the north, about halfway between Damascus and Aleppo, who has apparently built himself a decent little kingdom amidst the chaos of the Neo-Hittite and Aramean mixture up there. And the fourth major power, by troop count, is Urkanatu, which is apparently the name of a land or tribe or kingdom somewhere, but no one has any idea where this apparently significant kingdom may have been. And they only have 10 chariots for that 10,000 men, so they might not be very well established, or they might be a principally nomadic group. Now, among the next rank of powers on the list, the most notable leader is Gindabu of Arabia. This is the first mention in recorded history of Arab peoples, and the only thing we learn of them is that right as cavalry is being developed, so too is camelry down in the desert, and the two are seemingly on equal footing. Now, this is significant not only in being the first known and confirmed camelry, but this account is usually reckoned as the first certain historical evidence of cavalry as well, as well as actual men on horseback in the battle. And there are some recent art-based suggestions that say that horse riding may have been known here and there in the Near East prior to this, but these are pretty recent suggestions, and they haven't been fully investigated or accepted by the wider archaeological community just yet. Also, the Mycenaeans may have developed horse-riding warriors at the moment of their collapse in the 1200s, but we have no evidence of how that technology may have spread into the Near East. Anyway, what, what it really signifies is that selective breeding has changed the horse and possibly also the camel from a somewhat stumpy animal to something far closer to the horses and camels of today, finally capable biologically of handling the weights and stresses of combat. Now, I think most of us just intuitively understand that the face of warfare is changing with the introduction of cavalry and with all the stuff in this battle, but the full impact of the whole military side of things is going to get explored more when we get to the Assyrian Warfare Revolution. Now, the other participants in this coalition are Byblos, Sumer, and Arvad, three Canaanite cities, soon to be Phoenician cities, as well as Baasa of Ammon, and small forces from two more uncertain places. Usanat and Shianu. The text tells us that it's a coalition of 12 nations, but only lists 11, which has generated all manner of speculation, but it's probably just an error. Either one of the kings got forgotten, or the number was miscounted. This whole episode, with all its interesting details, is a good reminder for us to not be too certain in our reconstructions of the politics of this era, there's so much that we're surprised by, so much being developed, so many towns are rising and falling, and our evidence base is so thin. We hear about these kingdoms so little, and often we don't hear about them at all, that certainty is the enemy here. If anybody tells you they know what's going on in the Near East at the start of the Iron Age, I mean, they're either guessing or they're just wrong. But also, although Shalmaneser is going to tell us that he won this battle, we know in a strategic sense that he withdrew at the end and went back home, only to return a few years later. But we've gotten kind of far away from our Israelites and Judahites at this point. As much as we can talk about, about the Levant is going to be covered in the Assyria episodes, which are going to come soon enough. But I do want to close out this episode by reading for you the account of the battle and its aftermath, because, oh my goodness, I love reading Assyrian historical propaganda. Shalmaneser says, With the supreme forces which Asher my lord has given me, and with the mighty weapons which the divine standard which goes before me had granted me, I fought with them 
I decisively defeated them from the city of Karkar to the city of Gilzao. I felled with the sword 14,000 troops, their fighting men. Like a dad, I rained down upon them a devastating flood. I spread out their corpses and I filled the plain. I felled with the sword their extensive troops. I made their blood flow in the wadis. The field was too small for laying flat their bodies. The broad countryside had been consumed in burying them. I blocked the Orontes River with their corpses as a causeway. In the middle of the battle, I took away from them chariots, cavalry, and teams of horses. So make sure to join us next week as a major power oppresses their weaker neighbor, but the weak is able to throw off the shackles of oppression with the help of Almighty God. Meaning, of course, how the Moabites were able to wriggle out from under the thumb of oppressive Israel with the help of the god Chemosh. Thank you for listening.